Well, good evening. Great to see you all. We don't get to say this enough, but we're going to start Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And we're going to sing some Christmas songs, though. They're associated with Christmas. They're songs that we should sing all throughout the year, and we do. So if you would stand and join me. And the backgrounds won't be in Christmassy mode because I've got them up for the rest of the year, but we know it's Christmas time. Put a smile on our face and let's sing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. tree. Brother Barry is responsible for that. I'm sure he was over here placing each light in its spot. So it looks symmetrical. The lights I set back and let Ed and Bob do. Jim, they're needing some help in the gymnasium with a sound system. If you'll go over and if you don't get back in time, Jerry will lead that song, but they came over here in a panic. My wife walks in, I need Jim. <laughs> Got a couple folks to pray for. Emerson Carney's daughter, is she still in the hospital? Okay, and she had pneumonia. Give us her name again. Give me her name. Diane. Ivan Mace fell a week ago, had surgery on Monday on her elbow. Maybe it was the end of the week, but she is now home. Uh, in a lot of pain. Paul Hargett has been in and out of the hospital. Has, uh, I think he's back in now. has a bladder infection and some other things going on. Jim Ballard is headed up to Duke Medical Center on Thursday. Uh, Alan Scheffler, a little four-year-old boy that has broken his leg, uh, his heart is not doing well. And so uh, they need our prayers. Helen Holstein has been at home, and she has a rash all over her body. And she is suffering. Monday morning, uh, received a call from Dorothy Taylor's uh, daughter. Some remember Dorothy Taylor. She would sit back over in this section, little bitty woman, uh, would have been 90 years old in February. Uh, she's been in a nursing facility. A week ago, she fell and passed away Monday morning. Uh, they may have a funeral. They just don't know if she has been cremated or going to be cremated. And maybe a funeral on Sunday, we'll see. Uh, then they called, the daughter called, and 
the granddaughter actually, and ask about it. And she said, we'd like the funeral during the Sunday evening worship service. And I said, I'm sorry, we do that for very special people like ministers on staff. But that's reserved for very few. We just don't give up our worship service. I said, but you could have it at two or three. Because that's the window I have on Sunday, if you want them on Sunday. So we'll see, we'll let you know this Sunday morning what's going to happen there. Well, Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet together and study your word and offer our prayers to you. We do pray for Iva and for Paul, for Jim Ballard and Betty, also, Lord, for Emerson Carney's daughter, Diane. We ask you to bless Helen Holstein. Didn't mention Renee Green or Kathy Dean. We pray for each of them as well. And for Wilma Armstrong as she battles this cancer. For Glenn, her husband, who's ministering to her. We just ask you to bless each of these folks. They need help beyond what we can give. Some of them need help beyond what the medical community can give. They need help that only you can give. We ask you, Lord, to bless them, comfort them, speak to them. In Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, just before we get to our missionaries tonight, Jim mentions pastor putting up the tree, and Jim gets called out to fix the sound system out in the gym. The only thing I got going for me is that I'm wearing a Bill Lyles tie. So that ought to get me some points there. And uh, uh, Miss Bill, he is a great fella and did a great job here uh, at the church. All right, our three missionaries tonight, I'll give you their names first, and then we'll go right down the line. The Calicos in Romania, uh, the Comers in Mexico, and the Craigs in Japan. Uh, next week, uh, Janet Curtis. We haven't heard from Janet in quite a while, and uh, we've got a, a letter this fall in October, got it in November. Uh, the Desir De De family in Haiti, who was here uh, what, before they went to the field, and the Donatos in the Philippines, so that is for next week. But tonight, we are starting off with the Calicos in Romania, and uh, they're going to be coming up, I guess, on the board there, hopefully. If not, we'll get started. This is uh, from the uh, summer and, and fall. It says, greetings to our family and friends and partners. We hope you are all well in the midst of the pandemic. Know that your health and safety are being prayed for by the Coleco family. We hope that these updates about our ministry would encourage you and bring you joy during this season. Uh, COVID-19 update. As you may have guessed, everything has come to a halt since February the 24th. Romania has been closed and is and has unfortunately taken a toll on our ministry, our churches, and our people. Our gypsy people travel through Europe for work every spring and summer and fall, and the work that they do abroad earns them about 90% of their income so they have really been uh, affected uh, by that. Our churches, schools, Bible college, and ladies' ministries have been closed down. People are not even able to leave th their courtyard, but thanks to the power of social media, we can meet via Internet and Facebook. Uh, since our ministry is a nonprofit, uh, we have been able to get food to over 500 families monthly, and we praise God for his provisions. <clears throat> and then they talk about partnering with us. It says, imagine your pastor working a second job in order to raise salaries for the church staff, to pay for the construction of the church buildings, to pay church bills, and to provide for the physical needs of uh, each congregant. That pretty much sums up the Coleco family for the last three months. We are trusting in the Lord to provide fully Maybe the Lord wants to, uh, to use you. Uh, whether you can give enough to provide a meal for 500 or only uh, have a widow's might, we will call on you uh, to step out on faith and your generosity. Uh, our ministry has not skipped a beat miraculously. We will continue without skipping a beat. 
and you can be a part of this miraculous work we are trusting the Lord to do. Please continue to pray for the Coleco family at this time. We look forward to all God has in store. Uh, Tony and Kelly uh, Coleco doing a great job uh, under the circumstances the way it is uh, playing very difficult with their situation. So pray for their churches and for them being able to get open. We'll be praying for the Calicos this week. Okay, thank you so much. All right, somebody that we're mostly familiar with, if you were back here in the 70s, uh, the Comers, Richard and Patty Comer. Uh, this is back from the end of summer, and it just starts out, greetings, dear friends. In this world of quick travel to almost anywhere, and with our computers and smartphones, we are able to communicate almost instantly worldwide. But now, not being able to be with you personally is heartbreaking to us. Uh, it says the pandemic is ruthless. And Pastor and I were talking in his office yesterday about that. You know, uh, God made us to socialize and to be with people. And it's very hard to be separated like that. Uh, it goes on to say, I continue doing my Spanish messages on Facebook Live to Mexico, Central, and South America each Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, neither we nor you know all the things that are happening from day to day, but by prayer, we are holding one another up in the will of God. Thank you for your faithful support. In these unusual days, we love and pray for you, each of you, uh, Richard and Patty Comer. Also, if you remember when we did the Comers about, it takes us about three months to go through. Uh, if you remember, I read the letter then about Richard being attacked at a gas station. You remember that? And he was attacked by a guy with a knife, and he actually cut his uh, throat, and uh, uh, he went into surgery, and he went and spent a lot of time of the letter uh, going over uh, all of that, and he said uh, there was uh, some tough cartilage covering the thyroid gland that kept the knife from going any deeper uh, that could have possibly even caused death. But, uh, you know, a lot of times we just need to be thankful for God's protection. Amen? And uh, pray for Richard. He is doing uh, well. I communicate with them pretty regularly on Facebook myself, so... Uh, Richard and Patty, they were here when they were out on deputation in the early 70s. They used to have, over at the old church, the Spanish uh, work that we used to have. And uh, they're very uh, dear, near and dear to the folks here from First Baptist. We'll be praying for the Comers this week and uh, remember them in prayer. All right. And uh, we have our final letter from uh, the Craigs. They're our missionaries in Japan. And we received this letter in October. And it says, Dear Dr. Rumsey and friends, in August and September, we had a lot of people using our church camp. I think everyone just wants to get out of the house and do something. And that, that is true. Uh, they had about 60 people participate in the camp. In the countryside, people uh, only wear masks when shopping. People in the city, however, wear masks almost everywhere. Our church attendance has uh, just about returned uh, to the pre-pandemic level for which we are most thankful. The economy has definitely suffered. Many people have lost their jobs and income, but in general, things are slowly returning to pre-pandemic uh, normalcy. We love you, uh, your friends in Japan, uh, Bill and Terry, Craig, and uh, doing a good job there uh, in Japan. Uh, we'll be praying for them. All right, well, that's all of our missionaries. Now, remember next week, uh, Janet Curtis and uh, the others that we have, the Desers and uh, uh, Donatos will be our missionaries for next week. Let's have a word of prayer, remembering these t tonight as we've gone over them in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we bow before you, Lord, and we do thank you for your goodness. We pray for the Calicos and ask, Lord, that you would uh, be with them and as they have many of their families uh, misplaced because of the pandemic, especially the uh, gypsies of their ministry. Pray that you'd uh, bless them. Uh, Lord, we pray for the Comers. Ask that you'd be with them and glad that uh, uh, Brother Comer is recovering from uh, his injuries from that attack. And then for the Craigs in Japan, that things are 
uh, slowly coming back uh, to normal. So, Lord, we just pray now for our missionaries. We thank you for them. And we just pray now that you'd give us a good night. Be with Pastor as he brings the message and speaks to our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are going to sing number 67, Oh, Come Let Us Adore Him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm back there sitting, I go, please let us stay seated. I'm going to let you stay seated. Are we good? All right. Oh, come let us adore him. We'll sing the first, second, and last. All right, as we sing together on the first. Oh, come let us adore Stand for a moment. If you're the first row, you turn around. The second row, you keep looking this way. Then the third row, you turn around. The other row, keep looking this way so nobody's looking at your back, okay? Just, just yeah, just, <laughs> just, just wave at anybody across there, all right? Thank you for the good singing tonight. And after that, we are going to have Brother Sandy do the special. Remember the offering plates, if you're giving tonight, are at the front and also at the back. Brother Sandy. But a man, if he gain the whole world, but lose his own soul. There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord, where the call of His Spirit is lost. And you hurry along with the pleasure mad throng. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? If your soul should be lost, though you gain the whole world for your own, even now it may be that the line you have crossed have you counted, have you counted the cost? You may barter your hope of eternity's morn for a moment of joy at the most, for the glitter of sin and the things it will win. Have you counted, have you counted the cost? While the door of his mercy is open to you, ere the depth of his love you exhaust, won't you come and be healed? Won't you whisper? I yield, I have counted, I have counted the cost. Have you counted the cost? If your soul should 
be lost though you gain the whole world for your own even now it may be that the line you have crossed have you counted have you counted the cause have you counted have you We're going to be studying in the book of Luke tonight. We're going to be in three different passages. Luke 18 is the first one we're going to go to. Then we'll find Luke 7 and then Luke 11. We're doing an extended series on unknown or unnamed people in the Bible. And tonight we're going to look at three Pharisees who were not named. The problem with looking at unnamed or unknown people, if they're unnamed, it's really hard to remember where they were in Scripture. I can remember a few that I'd like to study. I can't remember. They're not named. I don't know how to look them up and find them even because I can't remember that much detail. But I'm still working on it. Sunday night, I mentioned a CDC study on masks, on cloth masks. And I put about 25 out there. They were all gone. And so I made more copies of them. Uh, there's actually four things here. One is the study on masks, uh, or actually the, the latest issue of the CDC on cloth masks, and they mention a study, and they say that it's the only study that they know of. It was from 2015, and the second page is that study uh, about cloth masks. Uh, most folks who are wearing masks today in the general public are wearing either the, the paper ones, the white and blue, or a cloth mask. Uh, the cloth masks are really getting popular, and they are a lot more comfortable. Uh, the, the disposable ones, you're really supposed to wear once and throw away. Uh, if they ever get wet, you're supposed to throw them away. It, you should never wear that disposable mask more than one day. No matter what, they become dangerous to your health. Uh, there's an, another study that uh, not really recognized as a study, but in May through July, uh, 1,800 Marines were, in 2020, were quarantined for two weeks before they went to basic training and then kept quarantined where they wore masks day and night, never took them off. And the study here tells how COVID got inside the barracks. They don't know how it got in. They did everything. They quarantined everybody. And still, uh, the, what it basically says is, we don't know how COVID is transformed, translated even now. Uh, there's a third study, or fourth, fourth piece of paper, a third study, about a 6,000-person study in Denmark, which was done uh, August, September, October. And uh, it's not really the study because the study can't get published. Uh, those who've read the study say it's excellent done. The problem is... The study from the 6,000 persons in Denmark, they don't go with the narrative of what the physicians want us to know. And so they can't find someone to publish it, even though they can't find any criticism of the study. Everybody who's read the study says it really well, and there's an article in there about this study, and they say, well, someone's eventually going to, to publish it. Uh, you can read it, what I'm told, but it's very expensive. You have to, it's behind a paywall, and I'm not about to pay the paywall because I am as tight as can be. To me, the internet is free, except for that monthly bill that I pay for it. Uh, but the whole thing of, thing, the more you get, the better off you are as far as education goes. Now, th something else to remember about the COVID stuff, whenever someone says, I'm going with the science, what they really mean is, I'm going with the scientist. Because if two scientists disagree on anything, they are both giving you science. So what you're saying is, I found the scientist I believe, and I'm going with the scientist. Uh, that might be good or it might be bad. There's two doctors in the United States who were before Congress. Matter of fact, one's a congressman, uh, Dr. Rand Paul, 
and the in infectious disease specialists was testifying in June, and they locked horns, butted heads. Uh, Dr. Rand Paul said that schools should not be closed down, and he also said the lockdowns were, were not wise, not good, and Dr. Fauci fought back, and the news media tore Rand Paul up. Well, this past Monday, Dr. Fauci has come around and agreed with Rand Paul. And Dr. Fauci said, children are not transmitters of the disease. Schools should not be shut down, and lockdowns have not worked. Well, that was what Rand Paul said back in June. So the doctor I went with was the scientist named Rand Paul, the doctor which the, most of America went with the scientist named Dr. Fauci. Who went with the science? Well, we each chose different scientists. Turned out that in this case, Dr. Rand Paul was correct and Dr. Fauci was wrong. I have respect for Dr. Fauci for at least coming around and saying, yeah, this is right. He, he never really said I was wrong. He just said this is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, it really makes no sense to shut schools down. Uh, we're, we're really doing some damage to children, uh, damage to families. There have been, what I understand, there have been children who have not been in school and have done nothing online since March of last year. And it's just, uh, it's going to hurt the poor folks the worst. And any child who's a little bit behind in school will be badly behind in school. Uh, I, I, I like to think of it this way. COVID is a terrible disease, and it's done some horrid things. It's really rough on older folks. And it's really rough on folks who have or are already sick. What if there was a brand new disease that was striking children down? And children from 0 to 10 were dying. Would we put a fence around Sun City Center? where no one from Sun City Center could leave? No, because it's not affecting people at that age group. So why are we doing things in schools when it's now known that children are not transmitted to the disease and, and when, they, it, when they do get it, it's, there's something in their body that's fighting it off and they're, and they're not even sick. We would not say, we wouldn't, I would be mad if Sun City Center was locked down because of a new disease among children. It doesn't make sense. Uh, I, I would like for folks to start coming up and saying, this is, this, stop hurting my grandchildren because there's something endangering me. And that's literally what's happening. That's, it, it's the opposite of what America's all about. Uh, the America that I love and lived in all my life is that I, as an adult, will sacrifice for my children and my grandchildren. And honestly, if every time my kids were sick, if I could have switched places with them and I took that illness on me, I would have taken it in a heartbeat. I, we need to pray for our country. Uh, pray for folks. Pray for those who are sick. It is real. Uh, but... If we exaggerate and we don't tell the truth, we actually hurt the reality of working and trying to fight the disease. Uh, I've talked to three of my doctors and I asked them, I said, are you, are you comfortable with the fact that physicians' integrity is being compromised? And they said, what are you talking about? And I said, you know that hospitals have been inflating the numbers of COVID deaths. One of my doctors said, but if, if the hospitals don't do that, then they're going to go bankrupt. And I said, what about integrity? And I said, doctor, your integrity is important to me because if I can't trust you, I won't come back to you. I'm putting my life in your hands. I have to be able to trust you. I don't want a doctor who lies. I want a doctor who's brutally truthful to me. I want him to say, what you're doing is going to hurt you. Or what you're doing is worthless. I just... Just tell me the truth. If it's brutal, fine. But I want my doctor to be really honest. Uh, I've done that with my physicians, with my dentist as well. Uh, and I ask all of them the same question. Are you more afraid of COVID-19 or the health department? And all of them said, COVID, I'm sorry. They all said, 
the health department. That's sad. There's a deadly disease and they're more afraid of the health department. Well, let's hit the Pharisees. Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 7, but first Luke chapter 18. When speaking to the Pharisees in Luke chapter 5, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The righteous that he was referring to who were the Pharisees. When we think of Pharisees today, we think of all the bad points. When reading the Gospels, very little good is said of these fellows, but they did not begin as a group of bad boys. Matter of fact, the Pharisees were some of the most highly thought of people in Jewish culture. They were respected. And their beginnings were very noble. In Israel, there were two main religious sects that, that kind of divided off. One were the Pharisees and one were the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the religious liberals who did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. At one time, the Pharisees were the religious fundamentalists. And what took place in the, in the Pharisees is that they, they started majoring on the minors. And before too long, they became a type of legalist. And now we actually refer to a legalist as one who believes in works for salvation, but a Pharisee is one who adds works, things you have to do. Those are the kind of folks we're going to be looking at tonight. They, they started out so well, but they became filled with pride and self-conceited. And, and the result was the Pharisees got a distorted view of themselves. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 says, For I say... Through the grace given unto me, to every man is among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. In the Talmud, which is a collection of Jewish laws and commentary, there are seven types of Pharisees listed, and it's a tongue-in-cheek thing. Let me share you the categories. First of all, there was a shoulder Pharisee. A shoulder Pharisee would wear the, a list of his good deeds, so everyone would know what he did. They would literally have their good works printed on the borders and the hems of their clothing. So they're like, right here, and right here, and on my pants. And they didn't wear pants, on my robe. So they would write their good works so everyone would know how, what good people they were. And you say, that's ridiculous. Why would they do that? Well, they took a scripture out of context. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 through 9. Jews were told to talk of the law when they sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign on thy hand. How would you bind the law for a sign on your hand? Well, you put it on your cuff. They eventually got to where they would not have the law on their cuff, but their good works on their cuff. Because that's what they talked about all the time. Verse 9 says, write them on the post of your house, write them on the gates. By the way, the high priest in Israel would wear the law on the hems of his garment. That was mandated. It would be embroidered in. And so when you saw the high priest, you would see the Ten Commandments in his clothing. Can you think of an American equivalent? Ever been to Washington, D.C. and gone inside the Supreme Court? Around the Supreme Court, the Ten Commandments are written in the walls. When you walk in, it's a reminder of where our country has come from. There's another Pharisee. He's called the wait a little Pharisee. Jesus met one in Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. That one man came up and said, Look, Master, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, well, you're welcome to follow me. But the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not to where to lay his head. And then that Pharisee, the wait a minute Pharisee, said, I'll follow you, but after I bury my father. Now, that doesn't mean his father was dead. That was a saying that I'm not going to do it now. When the time is right, when the time's convenient, I'll do it. When my father dies and after he's buried, then I'll serve you, Lord. That's a wait a minute, Pharisee. Wait a little, Pharisee. They constantly beg for more time to do the good deeds that they ought to be doing. One I like really well is called the blue, bruised and bleeding Pharisee. This fellow wants everyone to know that he does not lust in his heart for the women he sees during the day. So when he's on the street walking and he sees a woman coming his way, he would close his eyes. And the result would be he tripped, he stumbled, he walked into walls. And then he proudly wore the signs on his head and his face. He has bruises and scabs, and those were signs of honor. 
I don't lust. You, right there. You can, you, you can, I'm, I walked into that wall so I wouldn't lust. How about a painted or humpback Pharisee? It's a strange sounding thing. They would paint themselves white or walk very bent over. Why? Could I possibly be more humble? Remember when Jesus talked about you're a bunch of whited walls? Speaking to Pharisees? Ah. Puts a whole new meaning on it. May have been a whited wall Pharisee, right? But they could have all been. How about a reckoning Pharisee? They would constantly say, what good should I be doing to balance out what I have neglected to do? I should have done good yesterday, so what good should I do to make up for it? It's the old idea that in heaven you got this scale. You got to do more good than bad so I can get to heaven. How about a fearing Pharisee? A fearing Pharisee was one who was so afraid of God that they actually made him out to be a bad guy. And they were negative towards God. And then there was a class of really fine men. They called him the God-loving Pharisee. It's what every Pharisee should have been. This is a man who acted out his religion, lived it in his heart, lived it in his life. He genuinely loved God and wanted to please him. Sadly, this man was a rare breed. For most of the Pharisees were known for their hypocrisy. Wrong motives. My son Joshua, as a Jewish rabbi who was beneath him, Joshua's a major and this guy's a captain, and they work together. And this Jewish fella says, I am a Pharisee. Well, proudly. It's been very interesting when Josh tells me how they work things. The, the Jews have a different way of thinking. You know, a Jew on the Sabbath is not to, supposed to start a fire. That would be work. You could put a fire out, but you can't start one. That's just one of the laws. And so this Jewish family on Friday night before 5 o'clock turns every light on in their house. Because turning a light on is the equivalent of starting a fire. You could start a fire when you do it, but also you're making someone else work by having your lights on. You're adding, but you're welcome to put a fire out at night. So during the night, as they finish your room, they'll turn the light off. They never turn the light back on. And in the morning, they don't need the light. And so they get away the, the idea of working on the Sabbath by doing this little silly, picky thing. Josh tells me the story, and I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, Dad, I'm telling you, I'm not kidding. This is what they do. Can you imagine being bound up in that sort of legalism? It's Phariseeism. Well, in chapter 18, there's a Pharisee and a publican. It's a parable. And he, Jesus, spake this parable, and the certain was twisted trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Who would it be that trusted themselves that they were righteous and despised others? Mm, Pharisee. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I get tithes of all I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Those who self-identified as Pharisees trusted in themselves they were righteous. That's bad enough. But when you despise others, it takes it worse. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees were very well respected, and the publicans were not respected. They were tax collectors who worked for the Roman government. They were viewed as a social blight, a public nuisance. And they believed, the Jews, that a publican enabled government-sanctioned theft. And they believed correctly. Verse 18, Jesus said this, I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Pharisee exalted himself. The publican humbled himself. Jesus Christ honored the publican. 
Pharisee had a big head, small heart. Publican had a small head and a big heart, especially when it came to God. In matters of righteousness, Jesus said it's better to admit and confess sin than to live in self-righteousness. Now, the danger of being Pharisee-like is greater for those who have been saved for many years than for those who have just been saved very briefly. As those, if you've been saved for a lot of years, as I have, you have years of good works and good living to be proud of. Now, we can even openly brag about it. We can be bra- proud in our hearts. I have a friend who is taking care of another friend, dying years of smoking and drinking. The man has destroyed his liver, destroyed his lungs. And this other friend is helping him, taking care of his business, just wrote to me and told me about it. And I said, I am so glad that I never started either one. That would have been fine. And then I became a Pharisee because I said, I've never even had a cigarette touch my lips. It's true. And I've never tasted a beer, which is also true. That was the Pharisee in me coming out. Would it have been sufficient to say, I'm really glad I never started smoking or drinking? Yeah. I didn't have to brag about my righteousness. I mean, could you imagine a more righteous teenager than me who never smoked or drank? I mean, phew. After I did it, I thought to myself, I wish I was studying something different this week. Because within a day after doing that, it was on Monday that I wrote that, I wrote this message. I worked on it. The sin of pride is really subtle. It can sneak up on us, overtake us before we recognize its presence. Now, it is true that I have never smoked or drank. I have a few other sins we're not going to talk about. I would be better off to be looking at those sins in my life and act like a publican. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Rather than be acting like a Pharisee and saying, thank God I've never done this. Thank God I've never done that. I put myself in the wrong category. I said it's, it's easier for those who've been saved a long time because if you've been saved a long time and, and trying to live a righteous life, you can have years and years of years of good living. Someone gets saved after years and years of sinning, their sin is still recent in their memory, and they are very grateful to God for what God has done for them. They're more like the publican, less like the Pharisee. Now, there are a couple methods that Satan loves to use, overt temptation and covert, which is self-righteousness. You can get into sin because you're tempted by sin, or you can get into sin because you think you're something special. 1 John 2.16 calls these things the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. Those are the overt temptation and then the pride of life, and that's the covert temptation. That's the one that sneaks up on you when you've been saved a long time. Well, I'm sure glad I don't behave like those people. Really, the truth is, but for the grace of God, there go I. Had I not been in a Christian home, had I not had a very healthy fear of my Father and my Heavenly Father, I would have been involved in the very sins I was bragging about not getting involved in. I didn't start smoking for a couple good reasons. Number one, if my dad ever caught me, I didn't know what he would do. Second of all, I had a heavenly father that I was trying to please. Same with the, with the drinking. My motivation was as much for my earthly father as for my heavenly father. And with my earthly father, 
It was not a righteous motivation. It was a motivation preservation. I didn't want to deal with that man. He was a lot bigger than me and a lot meaner than me. And I didn't want to deal with him. In, growing up, there's two things I didn't want to deal with. I didn't want to deal with my dad screaming or my mother's crying. I would have rather my dad screaming than my mother's crying. My dad yelled a lot more than my mother cried. But when my mother tr- cried, there were times I remember thinking, I wish they would just beat me. Not cry. That just tears me up. Just let dad come home and spank me. It would have been over with. Number two. Second Pharisee comes along in chapter 7. One of the Pharisees desired him, Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat meat. Verse 37 of Luke 7. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know what kind of, what manner of woman this is that touches him. He's a sinner. She's a sinner. Verse 40, and Jesus answering said unto Simon. Now, but remember Simon thought that. Can you imagine if you're walking with Jesus or in a home and Jesus says, just picks up, you're thinking something and he just answers your thought life? You talk about scary. Every now and then my wife tries to finish my sentences. And I will say something like, you can't finish my sentences. You can't get in my head. And if you had gotten in my head years ago, you wouldn't like me anyway. Don't try to get in my head. You'll never know what I'm thinking. I try to keep the mystery in our relationship. Okay. <laughs> Might as well try. She tries. There are times Jesus and the disciples were walking along, and the disciples are whispering in the background, or one of them is thinking to themselves, and he, Jesus addresses it. You better. Jesus knows what you're thinking. Keep, keep it clean, man. Verse 40. Let's go back and hit it. I I was starting to read at verse 45. Verse 40 says, And Jesus said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast judged rightly. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, See thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. He saith unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. To the self-righteous public in this raw show of emotion from this immoral woman was disgusting. Jesus allowed this unholy woman to touch her. He accepted her offering. Her tears were falling on his feet. She took her hair and wiped the dirt off of his feet with her hair. Then she took ointment and anointed his feet. Have you ever heard some preacher say, member of my congregation played the lottery and won the lottery and tied the money, I wouldn't accept it. Where do you think this woman earned the money to buy the alabaster box of perfume? She earned it in acts of prostitution. 
now she's using the perfume purchased through prostitution to anoint Jesus' feet, and he knows all of it, and he lets it go. For someone that has pride, washing another's feet would be difficult. For someone who has pride to come up behind someone and grab their legs, crying enough to where your tears fall off your cheeks to their face, to their feet. That would be beyond humiliating. Using your own hair to dry the dirty feet that your tears have turned into mud. Unthinkable. Kissing those feet. Then anointing with expensive perfume. It'd be a stretch. When I studied today, I thought to myself, do I love Jesus that much? I don't think I do. You know why? I haven't been give, forgiven nearly as much as this woman. I'm the Pharisee that never smoked a cigarette and never drank a beer. This woman had been forgiven lots. Therefore, she loved him more than the one who was forgiven for less. Just the mere thought, just phrase it this way, that there's a prostitute who loves Jesus more than I do. That hurt. So here's a sinner who's busy doing something for Jesus and a Pharisee who's doing nothing except letting him be in his house, and he's the one who is proud. He's a very long list of I don't do, I don't do that, I don't do this, I don't do that, and he's pr very proud of himself for what he doesn't do and hasn't done. She's an obvious sinner and rightly ashamed. Verse 44 through 46, Jesus focused more on the serving than the sinning. And he praised what was done rather than what was not done. You know, the longer you are a believer, the easier it is to get in the trap of I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do this. And yet the Great Commission tells you to be a witness. Do you witness? When's the last time you told someone about Jesus? When's the last time you invited someone to church? It's easy to slip into this Pharisee thing when you're proud of what you don't do. And you're leaving off what you've been told to do. Now, I feel sorry for Simon. Does that make me a Pharisee even again? The man risked a lot to invite Jesus to his house. He's a Pharisee. The Pharisees hate Jesus. He invites Jesus to his house. You think his Pharisee friends are going to be happy about that? He's going to get it. They're going to lamb blast him. And then things get out of control when this woman sneaks in, steals the Lord's attention, slobbers out loud, making a big scene, and then stinks up the place with strong perfume. And then when he complains, he gets rebuked in his own house. Not for what he said, but for what he thought. Not for what he did, but what, for did, what he didn't do. Now, I love Jesus. I honestly do. I think at times he would be hard to be around. If for nothing else, I know what you're thinking. Why don't you stop that? He knows everything I've ever thought. In Luke chapter 18, verse 19, verse 9 through 13, first one we studied, Jesus chided a Pharisee for being proud of the good works that he did and looking down on the publican. Now he chides a Pharisee for his pride concerning what he did not do and for looking down on a prostitute. Well, if you can't look down on a publican and you can't look down on a prostitute, who can you look down on? It's a 
can look down on yourself because you know you're a sinner and you know the sins you committed better than anybody else. By the way, the same chapter, well, I'm sorry, in John chapter 8 tells the same story. But then just before that, there's the story of the woman taken in adultery. And Jesus' response was, yeah, you all want to kill her? You condemn her? Let the guy without sin cast the first stone. And then he looked at him. He wrote in the ground and he looked at him. And Scripture says, one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they left. Jesus did not say sinners were good, the publican, the prostitute. But neither did he say the Pharisees were good. And then, just as the Pharisees pointed out the sins of others, Jesus pointed out the Pharisees' sin. He forced them to reap what they had sown. On the screen is going to be Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, which is one of the most misunderstood scriptures in, in all of the Bible. And I'm going to help you understand it right now because it has to do with sowing and reaping. Judge not lest ye be judged. Oh, we love that one. Don't judge me. Keep reading. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. Jesus lacked patience with these people for good reason. Years ago, I was dealing with a family who was in turmoil. They were fighting. One of the family members was being accused of adultery by a family member who had fathered a child out of wedlock and had slept with his current wife before they got married. And it came to me. I got called, went to the house. I knew the situation. And I said to the Pharisee, the guy who had fathered a child out of wedlock and had slept with his wife before they got married, you need to stop. He said, we have a family intervention. We need to stop this right now. And I said, you need to stop or I'm going to make you stop. And he said, this needs to stop. And I said, you slept with at least two women that were not your wife. One was the mother of your child, and the other was this woman you're living with now. I know that you slept with her because I watched your children on the night that you did. My wife and I babysat for them. He said, well, thanks for showing all this, telling everybody about my sin. That's exactly what you're doing. You're doing that. To, if you do that to others, expect it to be done to you. That's what Matthew 7 says. If you treat people that way, they're going to treat you that way. You deserve it. So if you've got a pet peeve, you better make sure that pet peeve isn't something you've done. I had another friend who years ago took his then girlfriend off to get an abortion. And then about 15 years later, I heard him preaching against abortion, and he was mad about abortion. And I went to him and said, you better be careful. I referred to Judges to Matthew chapter 7, and I said, you're guilty of the very sin and the very thing that you are condemning now, you better be careful. Because there are people who know what you did. And if you step on the wrong foot and the wrong toe, they may come forward and expose you. Now, I never said a thing about exposing him. The man just almost went to his knees to beg me to not tell his wife, please, I have no intention of telling your wife. I'm telling you to stop this because those who know you well know you're being a hypocrite. Judge not lest ye be judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And even to the measure you throw it out, that's how much it's coming back. Romans chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Thou art excusable, O man, who judges, or thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest does the same thing. 
by his words, Jesus showed the Pharisees they were not as hot as they thought. And as a result, they hated him. He explained that hatred to his disciples in John chapter 5 and verse 22. He said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they had not had sin. They would now have no cloak for their sin. It's as if Jesus took their coat off and showed what they were wearing underneath. Their coat was covering them, but the presence of Jesus exposed them for what they were. Now, when that happens to a publican, he cries for mercy. When it happens to a Pharisee, they get mad. One last one. Luke chapter 11, verse 37 through 54. And as Jesus spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with... Uh, it is, right, same one. I got my mind on the last one. This is right. As he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. He went in and sat down to meet. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which also within also? But rather give alms of things such as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and love of God. These ought you have do done and not leave the other undone. Verse 43, woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uttermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for as are graves which appear not and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou reproachest us also. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and build their sepulchres. Verse 49, therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them shall slay and persecute that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. For from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished beneath the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation, woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not yourselves, and them that are entering in ye hindered. And as these things he said unto them, the scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to not provoke him to speak of many things lying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. What would Jesus do if he met someone who was self-righteous? He might get in their face. Like I said easier earlier, Jesus might not be the easiest guy to be with. This whole what would Jesus do thing, I don't think people, most folks talking about what would Jesus do, have ever read the scriptures and look at what he would do. When it came to someone who was self-righteous, he's rough. By the way, a lawyer he's speaking of here, a lawyer is someone who had mastered the Pentateuch. That's the law for Israel. And so a lawyer is someone who is an expert in the law. You experts of the laws, woe unto you. These, these Pharisees, they, they're a neat group who spends time in sanctified surroundings. They, sit, they were secluded from the evil influences of the world. They, they lived in monastery-like settings, shielded from the world's temptations. They spent time in the scripture studying for themselves and teaching others what to do, but they refused to help people live like they should. They blurred the lines between what was conviction and what was preference. They lived the law and tradition, watching for details. That's verse 42. And they expected others to do the same. They were merciless when someone didn't rise to their standards. Their quest to fulfill the law made them proud-filled, and they failed to fulfill the law of God, which is the first commandment we saw on Sunday morning, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, repeated in Mark 12, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. This is the first commandment. By the way, you know why it's the first commandment? Most important. You know why the First Amendment in the Constitution is the First Amendment in the Constitution? It's the most important. The Second Commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
in the United States of America. What's the second amendment to the Constitution? The right to bear arms. Our founders thought that was so important that it's number two. By the way, our president-elect is, is already promising to take that away. Here's a real thought. He's promised to change the Constitution, but to get in the office, he's got to put his hand on the Bible and swear to protect and defend the Constitution. What's that called? Is it perjury? Is it treason? Anybody who wants to change the Constitution is unworthy of any office in America. Okay? If you have to take an oath of office and you want to change it in any way, you are not qualified. So, in the congregation and listening on the, on the if you voted for him as a Christian, first of all, I can't believe you'd do that. I don't understand the mindset. Pro-abortion. I don't understand it. You, you believe in the right to life. You believe in Scripture. You believe all life is sacred. You believe that human life is created in the image of God, but you'll vote for someone who wants to kill babies up to the moment they're born? Wow. I, I don't understand you. I really don't. The Apostle Paul put this law this way, Galatians 5, 5.14. All the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. James called it the royal law according to the scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All the good that the Pharisees did was void and done in vain because they lacked love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, it's on the screen. According to Luke eleven fifty two, the Pharisees were self-righteous but not righteous with God. Not right with God. In conclusion, let me give you three comparisons between the Pharisee and the publican, Luke 18, who was justified? The sinful publican was. Between the Pharisee and the prostitute in Luke 7, who was honored? The sinful prostitute was. Between the Pharisee and the public, who was who did Jesus defend? The sinners. The good people and the Pharisees were the best people Israel had to offer. But they're self-righteous. They're the worst sinners in Jesus' eyes because they trusted in themselves rather than in God. That's chapter 18. They were not humble to serve the Lord. That's Luke 7. They would not confess their sin and ask forgiveness because they believed they were not sinners. That's chapter 11. Therefore, these people who were the best in Israel were both unforgiven and unrepentant. They were proud of themselves and critical of others, which caused Jesus to say to a Pharisee in Luke 5, 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sadly, the self-righteous, calling the self-righteous to repent is, is a... It's an impossible task. I wanted to say a fool's errand, but nothing Jesus was on is a fool's errand. But Jesus didn't come to call the righteous. They're not going to repent. In their mind, if you've never sinned, you're not going to repent. But if you've sinned, you will. Let me give you some closing warnings and we'll go. Matthew 7, verse 5. I want to keep going this time. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eyes, but consider not the beam that is in your own eye? And how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, which is a splinter, and behold, the beam is in thine eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine eye, then thou shalt seek clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. So you got something right here. You can't help anybody because of what's in front of you. you. Instead of looking at other people's sins, look at your own sin. Now, even if it's reversed and you've got a little bitty speck and they've got a big one, you still got a speck. 
And you need to get rid of the speck. James 4, 11, 12. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? You see, the Pharisees were great judges of others. Romans 2, 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest does the same things. You say, but preacher, if I judge somebody that's committed adultery and I've never committed adultery, then I'm okay? No, because the scripture says if you've committed one sin, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. You're, you're judging someone for breaking the law, and you've broken the law. And you might justify it by saying, my sin's not as bad as their sin. Well, is your sin enough to get you in hell? Sin is pretty serious. Maybe in man's eyes, your sin isn't as bad as somebody else's, but it's bad enough that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Therefore, you don't have a whole lot to, to brag about. You're a sinner in need of a Savior, just like the prostitute. Same blood that saves her, saves you. Matter of fact, without the blood of Christ, same place she goes, you would go. Heavenly Father, we've now seen three Pharisees whose names we don't know. And you see, we've seen one Savior who we do know. Our eyes have been opened to what pleases our Savior, what displeases Him. We now see how He treats the self-righteous. Help us to remember that for the grace of God, there go I. May we not become full of ourselves. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for coming out tonight. I enjoyed it.